Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, special breakfast event. Bienvenue, Madame et Monsieur. Um, we are especially uh, pleased and honored to uh, welcome the President of Iceland, Olafur Ragnar Grimson, to this event here at the Rideau Club, co-hosted by the Centre for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say, and the Embassy of Iceland. And I'd especially like to thank and welcome our co-host, uh, Sturla Sigur Jonsson, the Ambassador of Iceland to Canada. We have many esteemed guests here today. We have uh, members of parliament, we have ambassadors, we have senior government officials, uh, members of academia, non-governmental organizations, the private sector and media. Everyone here is a VIP, so I cannot introduce you all, uh, but I'd like to thank you all for coming. And uh, our event today is titled The Global Arctic, A New Model of Global Cooperation. And to more properly introduce our honored guest today, I would like to call on John Higginbotham, he is a senior fellow at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. He's also a distinguished fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation and leads CG's research work on Arctic governance and Arctic policy. So John, please come on up. Uh, thank you very much, Fred. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see such a impressive turnout of uh, Ottawa's uh, Arctic fraternity here. Uh, it's a great pleasure and uh, an honor for me to introduce uh, President Olafur Ragnar Grimson to, uh, to you all. I first encountered our guest uh, in Alaska about three years ago at a major international Arctic conference, the uh, Arctic Imperative Summit. That conference made a great difference to me uh, personally because I was at that time uh, had just left government and I was looking for something that would keep me busy keep me out of the bars and things uh, 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 after government and I settled though I'd had a long experience in foreign affairs and in transport I'd mainly specialized in China uh, policy planning uh, uh, the United States uh, transport and so forth but I gradually came to realize, I think, the importance of looking at the Arctic as one of the key factors of change uh, facing Canada and uh, the Arctic nations and the world uh, in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, I uh, had heard that a head of state was uh, going to be onerous with his presence, and that's, where, of course, where I first uh, encountered uh, uh, President Grimson. I was very struck by the power of his ideas and uh, he gave at that time a very interesting speech uh, on the Arctic and on the need for cooperation in the Arctic. What impressed me most was his, his long-term vision of the opportunities and challenges created by the rapid melting of the Arctic Ocean climate change and the huge range of uh, national and international policy issues that have to be faced by all of us in dealing with the Arctic. At the same time, his, uh, I found his basic optimism about an, an energy devoted to the Arctic uh, well balanced by concern about the challenges that uh, climate change is going to bring to the Arctic and particularly the uh, environmental, uh, Aboriginal issues, and also the paramount need for international cooperation among Arctic stakeholders. Uh, I have been working on the Arctic ever since. I've been uh, keeping myself out of trouble, organizing a number of private stakeholder meetings, largely Canadian but with a heavy American presence on uh, Arctic marine issues, Arctic governance issues, uh, all, all different issues trying to nudge the uh, stakeholders to cooperate even more with each other within government, between government and industry, between nations and so forth. So very much along the, the themes that uh, the President's speech inspired me to do. Um, I might say that in this effort I've been uh, 
received the st strongest possible support from uh, CG, from Carleton, and from uh, a number of government departments uh, that are interested in the Arctic. Uh, it will take us a while to really build up the enthusiasm and the energy in North America around these important changes in the Arctic. We have to, we're not really there yet in respect of our, our understanding of the urgency of anticipating and shaping Arctic development. Uh, President Grimson himself is personally uh, uh, contributing to this effort. For the last couple of years, he's hosted the highly successful Arctic Circle conferences held each fall in Reykjavik. Thousands now come every year for what is uh, the world's premier non-governmental meeting, I would say, of, uh, it's, it has become a remarkable marketplace of ideas and networks and personalities. And as a, as a good diplomat, uh, he also uh, is very conscious of uh, Iceland's own national interests in uh, taking full advantage of its uh, Arctic location and advantage. I think, for example, as somebody who has been looking particularly at Arctic marine issues, uh, the proposals going around for uh, creating a uh, Arctic marine hub port in Iceland as a way of taking advantage uh, of uh, increasing traffic through the northern sea route in Russia and other sea routes as they become opening. We're very lucky to have him with us today. He's been president of Iceland for nearly 20 years. His role is not merely symbolic. He was, uh, uh, he has, he's an elected president, which is, uh, with important powers that he's exercised on occasion internally on critical national questions. To give you an idea of the prestige, his prestige and legitimacy in Iceland, he was elected by large majorities or acclamation for each of his terms. Uh, Mr. President, I'm sure I speak for all of us here in welcoming you to Ottawa, capital of a, an Arctic nation slight, <coughs> slightly larger than yours. Uh, but which, which we as a country face many unique issues and challenges in Arctic social and economic development. I believe we can learn much from Iceland's coherence, focus, and energy in pursuing its Arctic advantage. I hope you can speak frankly to us about the challenges we alone and together must uh, address in coming years. Your timing is coming, coming could not have been better. There's a growing awareness in Canada of new Arctic challenges, stimulated in part by our, uh, our recent successful chair of the Arctic Council. The quality of the audience that has come out to, to meet you and to listen to you this morning is a tribute to your remarkable experience and vision. We're delighted you're here, and I hope it's also a signal of Canada's awakening to the enormous forces of change uh, coming in the Arctic. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, Your Excellencies. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, <clears throat> kind introduction and uh, and for inviting me to uh, share with you here this morning um, my thoughts on the Arctic, especially as a territory of innovation in international, uh, international governance. I have uh, for a long time believed that uh, <clears throat> the Arctic is intellectually perhaps the most fascinating laboratory of governance innovation in the 21st century. I know it might sound as a startling comment to many who are interested in other international issues. But if you are ready, I'm prepared to argue that case for long hours uh, <laughs> in order to justify <clears throat> my conclusion. But let me also say I'm very pleased to be back in Ottawa. Uh, I came here first uh, 
In 1983, as a young parliamentarian, a member of an international parliamentary organization which was also trying to create uh, innovation in international governance for a meeting with, uh, with Pierre Trudeau. Uh, that was my first introduction to Canadian politics. Maybe I started at the uh, highest <laughs> level, but it was indeed a memorable encounter, especially for a young member of parliament from Iceland to witness the intellectual force of his argument, uh, the dynamic way he engaged uh, in, our, uh, in our discussion. And for the following years, I came here many times uh, to follow up on the success of, uh, uh, of those ideas. But as I remarked, uh, perhaps uh, in a lighthearted way, but since you are dedicated to governance innovation, I, I decided to mention it here this morning that although I've been president, as was mentioned now soon, for almost 20 years, this is my first time in Ottawa as president. But I had an extensive cooperation with Canada over my, throughout my presidency. Uh, been all over the country uh, to further this cooperation. In Manitoba, of course, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, the Northwest Territories, British Columbia, New, Newfoundland, you name it. So it's an interesting case for your institute uh, to study uh, how you can have a successful cooperation with Canada as president of another country without ever coming to Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it has been a very enjoyable uh, journey for me but also very important uh, for Iceland. But as I said, I'm very happy to uh, speak here this morning uh, in a forum led by a body dedicated to innovation in, uh, in international governance, because I believe very strongly from my own personal experience, not just as president, but also before, that the field of innovation in international governance and cooperation has perhaps been, uh, been neglected by the intellectual community, by the political community, and definitely by the diplomatic community, with all due respect to the ambassadors here this, uh, this morning. As all of you know, the emphasis is on traditions, uh, protocol, uh, if you can quote other cases before. But if you are in the field of innovation in international relations, that's a risky business. That is the traditional view. Better stick to what you know and what you've done before. But the success of the Arctic in the 21st century will depend entirely of how daring as well as uh, sophisticated we are in our innovative approach to the Arctic and how far we realize that already in the second decade of the 21st century, the Arctic has become a multi-dimensional innovation place for the entire world. And that is a view which is not commonly presented when people talk about the Arctic. So let me here this morning, before I'm willing to take any questions from you, put that into perspective and mention at least four dimensions of uh, innovations with respect uh, to the Arctic. But before, let me emphasize a few things. The first is this, the Arctic was, as we all know, for centuries, even millennia, completely unknown to the so-called enlightened world of Europe uh, uh, and the Western world. Uh, of course, the Inuit, uh, the indigenous people had been there, made it their home, knew their natural forces well. But it wasn't really until in the early years of the 20th century that we gradually, in the learned capitals of Europe and North America, started to pay attention. And oh, that's why the great explorers became world famous, because they traveled into territories that were unknown. Uh, William Stephenson of Icelandic origin, the famous Canadian explorer, of course, reached world fame as an example of that force. And then the Cold War, for almost 50 years, closed the Arctic because of the military confrontation, because of the uh, mutual threats 
between uh, the Soviet Union on one hand and uh, the US-led NATO countries uh, on the other. So for almost the entire second half of the 20th century, this was a no-go zone for any practical purposes, for economic operation, uh, even for research, for political dialogue. It was perhaps the most militarized part of the planet with respect to the Cold War. And then all of a sudden when that ended in the 1990s, the Arctic states gradually came together based on previous scientific cooperation and decided to establish uh, the Arctic Council in a very hesitant way, careful way, with uh, a very limited uh, agenda. So there is only about a quarter of a century or so, 25, 30 years, that this big part of the planet has been open to international cooperation to dialogue uh, and projects. We are, in fact, in a completely uncharted territory with respect to how to organize and cooperate in a vast part of the planet. And that is the second thing I want to emphasize before I come to my analysis, is how vast, how big a part of the planet the Arctic actually is. Because somehow in all our languages, the terms we use about the Arctic somehow convey a limited land space. We talk about Lapland, uh, we talk about Alaska, we talk about the Arctic as if it is of a similar size. We tend to forget, perhaps one doesn't have to emphasize it in Canada, but one tends to forget that if you go across the Arctic, you have Greenland, half the size of Western Europe. Half the size of Western Europe. You have the vast northern territories of Canada. You have Alaska, twice the size of Texas. You have the multiple time zones in the northern part of Russia, and then the vast oceans that link these parts. We are, in fact, dealing with, and I've sometimes used the analogy as if suddenly we came to the African continent in the last 20 or 30 years. And there had been almost zero cooperation, zero awareness, zero structures with respect how to organize that big part of the planet, the African continent. And we had to face that challenge in the last 20 or 30 years. So when we approach our challenges in this century, we have to bear in mind, first of all, that this is a new journey. This is a virgin territory in international cooperation. And secondly, we are dealing with a big part of the planet. And thirdly, it is a part which harbors many of the essential resources for economic development and economic success in the 21st century. No leading economy of this new century will be able to develop and thrive and maintain its leadership without some presence or another within the Arctic. Due to the, the minerals, the minings, the rare metals, the energy resources and the opening of the sea routes that will link Asia to Europe and North America in a way that the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal did before. And one doesn't have to know very much about 20th century diplomatic and world history to realize how important the Suez Canal was for the, uh, for the 20th century. But it's also a territory where the fast growing <coughs> impact of climate change is clearly inevitable. I come from a country <clears throat> which has the largest glaciers in Europe. We have been studying them for over, to, over 50 years. We know they are melting, and they are melting fast. We don't need the, the Icelanders to go to international conferences to realize that climate change is a, is a challenge. 
We can invite you if you come for half an hour drive and show you the evidence in front of us. And Greenland is our next door neighbor. And now you have new rivers, you have new lakes, you have uh, the evidence of the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. And if only a third, <clears throat> if only a third of the Greenland ice sheet melts, it, the consequence will be a global rise in sea level everywhere in the world of two meters. For a planet where over half of mankind will, in the second half of this century, even more, live in coastal cities. So if it was only for all these aspects, this vast territory of the planet, which is a virgin territory for international cooperation, is of great significance and uh, concern. But somehow, Despite the formulation of the Arctic Council and the growing attention, it has been by and large off the international diplomatic radar screen. And to some extent, that has been good news because it has allowed us in the Arctic to develop these structures of cooperation free of the tension and the conflict and the concerns and the uh, and the, uh, the, and the turbulence that characterizes other parts of the world. So where are we now <clears throat> in the second decade of the 20th and 21st century with respect to the structures of Arctic cooperation? What are the major dimensions of uh, innovations uh, in uh, the Arctic? Let me present to you here four dimensions of how the Arctic has become this fascinating territory of uh, governance uh, innovation. First, the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council <coughs> created by the United States, Canada, uh, and Russia almost immediately after the Cold War was over, joined by the five Nordic uh, countries. It's the only international organization in the world where the Nordic countries have a majority. <laughs> and where we guide the United States and Russia towards a successful uh, cooperation. <clears throat> and I think we've made a pretty good job of it if you look at the results. But as I sometimes remind uh, my good friends, President Clinton and especially Al Gore, it's worth remembering that even if it was the uh, enlightened Clinton-Gore administration with respect to the climate and all those issues, the mandate of the Arctic Council in the beginning was a long list of what you could not do. So there was no secretariat, uh, they were only meeting every second year, there was no discussions on sensitive issues, uh, and so on and so forth. But it has somehow developed from this very limited mandate to become a successful agreement-making, treaty-creating organization with the Search and Rescue Agreement, the Oil Spills Agreement, with the framework of scientific uh, cooperation, and even in the last year or two, <clears throat> with the enormous difficulties uh, associated with conflicts in other parts of the world, including Ukraine, the Arctic Council cooperation, if you look at it from a broader perspective, has been kept away from those difficult conflicts. So when the US takes on the chairmanship of the Arctic Council from Canada, as it did uh, a few weeks ago, it can proceed fully, effectively, constructively, in cooperation with Russia and the rest of the world, as if the conflicts in other parts are not important. I am not saying that, that I'm not saying they are not important, but it's important to remember that we now have a track record of how the Arctic Council can move forward successfully despite conflicts and tensions in other parts of the world, which means that despite the, <clears throat> the limited mandate, the innovative structures of the Arctic Council are such that its strength, perhaps partly because it's off the radar screen, is such that 
monumental tensions and conflicts in other parts of the world do not freeze the situation, as was the case in the Cold War, that such phenomena would not have survived in the Cold War period. The second element is that the Arctic Council in its structure is more open and more democratic than any other similar international organization because of the way it invites the indigenous organizations and other non-governmental uh, organizations to be a part of the process. I don't know of any effective governmental organization of this kind which so openly recognizes the right of the indigenous people and their organizations as a part of the policy-making structure. And this was brought home to me in a dramatic way some years ago when I was in Bangladesh out on a boat looking at the effect of rising sea levels on Bangladesh. And the Minister of the Environment of that country, who also happened to be a king of a tribe of about 400,000 people, and that's more than we have in Iceland, started to give me an extensive analysis of the Arctic Council and how he was fascinated by the right and the position it had given to the indigenous people. And his vision and his hope was that in his country, Bangladesh, and in other parts of Asia and Africa, the smaller indigenous parts of those populations would have a similar position with respect to their governments or cooperation with other countries as has been developed within the Arctic Council. I found it fascinating that in Asia, and I have now seen this and heard in other parts of the world, this model of uh, open democratic invitation and willing to hear and listen to the voice of the indigenous people without them having a formal diplomatic position is already being looked at as a successful model for people on other continents and other parts of the world where the boundaries of countries are in many cases artificial, where the crossing of uh, state structures across old traditional lines of uh, communities and tribes uh, and groups uh, are such that there is a need for that kind of dialogue. <laughs> the third dimension is how the Arctic Council has evolved, especially recently, in inviting leading countries in, in Europe and Asia to the Arctic table. The decision taken in, in Karuna to have all the leading economies, and I say all the leading economies of Europe and Asia, at the Arctic table in one way or another is an historic decision. <coughs> and I think we are just beginning to realize the consequences of that decision, and by the term consequences, I mean it in a positive way. Of course, we still have to figure out what will be their exact role. What kind of a platform will they be given? I have listened to my good friend, uh, Monsieur Rocard, uh, the distinguished former Prime Minister of France, who was appointed by Sarkozy as the uh, special emissary of the President of France to the Arctic. Interesting that Sarkozy, some years ago, found it necessary to reach out to a distinguished former Prime Minister of France, perhaps the grand old man of French politics, and make him his emissary uh, on, uh, on the Arctic. It would be kind of similar to Obama asking Bill Clinton of, uh, of Bush Senior to be his representatives uh, on the Arctic in terms of Rocard's status in French politics. And he complained in Paris uh, to me and others about a year ago, having attended a number of meetings of the Arctic Councils and not being allowed to speak. And he said in this unforgettable way, France is not accustomed not to be allowed to speak. <laughs> but despite the early days, we now have a situation where more than half of the G20 countries have been accepted in one way or another 
formally, formally, by Canada, by the United States, by my own country, by Russia, and the other Nordic countries at the Arctic table. Japan, China, India, France, Germany, United Kingdom, Singapore, Korea. Korea is perhaps the most interesting of all of this, a kind of a wake up call if we doubt that the world is already paying attention because when she was elected president of Korea a few years ago, <coughs> The Arctic was among 20 priority issues for the new president of Korea. And she, uh, when taking office, mandated her administration to work out what was formally signed about a year ago, termed in English, the Korean Master Plan for the Arctic. If there was an another Asian country in that title, it would probably have made front page news uh, in uh, some countries. But why does the new president of Korea find it necessary to have a master plan in her administration for the Arctic? Singapore. Singapore appointed an Arctic ambassador about five years ago, has mandated all their bilateral ambassadors to Canada, United States, the Nordic countries, and Russia to have Arctic as the major concerns. And I can even, uh, if you don't quote me on it, tell you the story that when the Prime Minister of Singapore a few years ago came for a meeting in, in the White House, and the Singapore officials uh, came a few months before, as is the custom to prepare the visit, at the end of the preparatory meeting, the Singapore official said to the White House counterparts, and then of course the Prime Minister wants to talk about the Arctic. And the White House people didn't really take it seriously, and took it as a light-hearted comment, uh, almost a joke at the end of a long meeting. But what happened? The first item that the Prime Minister of Singapore put on the table when he met President Obama was to ask for the support of the United States in the Singapore engagement uh, in the Arctic. Why is Singapore so interested in the Arctic? For two obvious reasons. If the ice in our part of the world, especially the Greenland ice sheets, continues to melt, Singapore, as they know it, as we know it, will no longer be there. But secondly, their economy was created because they were a hub. They were a hub for the major transport system that evolved in the second half of the 20th century and is a preeminent foundation of the successful global economy in the 21st century. And if even a quarter or a third of the uh, container traffic start going the northern routes, it will have monumental consequences uh, on Singapore. That's why they are now looking for partners in the Arctic. Uh, Minister Tan was up in Alaska a few weeks ago with a delegation indicating the willingness of Singapore to invest with Alaskan partners in looking at the possible construction sites for uh, Arctic harbors and other infrastructure. Similarly, uh, uh, the port authorities uh, in Bremen, the second largest harbor in Germany, the 16th largest harbor in the world, came to us in Iceland two years ago and made an agreement with many of our engineering companies and also the ministries to study extensively an area in northeastern part of Iceland where Bremen Port believes might be an excellent location for a potential Arctic harbor in the decades to come. And like the Singaporean ambassador said to us a few years ago, with all due respect to you in the Nordic countries, you have no experience in running an Arctic harbor. An Arctic harbor that is a global harbor. You have export-import harbors for your own countries. But there are not very many in the world that have developed a global harbor on the scale that the Arctic might see in the second half or the middle of the, uh, of the 21st, uh, 21st century. Costco, the largest shipping company in the world, sent the first container ship from Singapore, uh, from, from, Shanghai, uh, from Shanghai to Rotterdam. Uh, two years ago, and studied thoroughly uh, that journey. Not only that 
how much they saved in terms of energy, that it took 10 days shorter than, uh, than going through the old routes, but also the effect on the crew in terms of uh, the psychological impact, the health impact, and all that. It was impressive to see how thoroughly Costco was preparing itself, like Korea is now in their shipping yards, building new type of ships that do not need icebreakers to go ahead of them in order to go through these new sea routes. So, it is not only that we have accepted more than half of the G20 countries in one way or another at the Arctic table, their governments, their leading companies, have already arrived in our backyard. But above all, their scientific institutions are major contributors to the studying of the Arctic environment to the melting of the ice, of the natural resources. And this scientific component is another fascinating dimension of the innovative aspect of Arctic governance. Because despite everything, up to now, it has been led by science. Every government in the Arctic, not only the Arctic states in the Arctic Council, but also these new arrivals, acknowledge that science has to be the leading guide for two reasons. One is the ignorance of our knowledge, how little we know about this vast territory, this uncharted region of the world. And secondly, the risks are so high. It was uh, impressive to listen to President Putin a few years ago in an Arctic conference up in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Yamal Nemitz where he explained that despite the power of Russia, despite the power of the United States, it was important to make international scientific cooperation the fundamental premise of Arctic cooperation because no country was equipped either in manpower or infrastructure or machinery to do the necessary science on its own in the Arctic. So if we were going to make a success of the Arctic future, the message from President Putin was the need for constructive, broad, international scientific uh, cooperation. The fourth dimension in this uh, innovative laboratory is what was mentioned here in the introduction, how uh, some of us came together a few years ago, and I think I described the vision of in Alaska when we were there three years ago. Then it was a vision, a plan, an idea, that there was a need to create a new type of gathering for the Arctic, almost a kind of an Arctic Davos, to use a model that people knew and were familiar with. Because up to that time, three years ago, uh, Arctic conferences had been mostly specialized, rather small, and limited in number and difficult to attend because they were all over the place. So some of us from, from the United States, from Iceland, from other parts of the Arctic, including Canada, came together and we created what was called the Arctic Circle. And the aim was to have every year a large assembly of all those who are interested or concerned about the Arctic in an open invitation where your financial strength is not a hindrance to anybody, whether it's a student or activ activist or a president or a corporate leader or whoever can come and be a part of it. And the second part of that structure was that in addition to the plenary sessions organized by us, half of the time would be devoted to breakout sessions where any institutions like your policy institution here or the government of Canada or companies like uh, Costco or scientific institutions, whoever, to or could organize their own breakout sessions in their own name, decide their own agenda, decide the speakers, and use this big tent or this huge Arctic village square for their own purposes in highlighting uh, their concerns, their projects, asking and inviting others to be a part. Of course, up in Alaska three years ago, when I described this in my speech, it was a vision. But now we have a track record. Now we have the proof that the global community welcomed the creation of such a forum annually in Reykjavik in October, middle of October in an extraordinary way. 
We have had two assemblies so far. The third will be in October this year. Attended by over 1,500 people from more than 40 countries. It has become the largest annual international gathering uh, on the Arctic. And this October, President Hollande of France will come and make the opening speech at the assembly. And that by itself is an interesting signal that the President of France finds it uh, necessary and accepts an invitation to come to the new Arctic Circle Assembly and make a major policy speech on the Arctic and how it relates to the climate negotiations that will start in Paris a few weeks later. <coughs> Similarly, President Xi of China has accepted the invitation and mandated his government to organize the so-called country session of the Arctic Circle Assembly in October, where China will present mandated by the president, its policy, its vision, its concerns, its plans, its scientific contribution uh, to the Arctic. Similarly, Chancellor Merkel of Germany has decided also and mandated her government to organize the similar country-based session where the leading economy of Europe will present the contribution of German science, German business community, the German political community to the future uh, of the Arctic. Similarly, there will be formal delegation from Japan, Korea, Singapore, United Kingdom, uh, as well as all the Arctic, uh, all the Arctic states. It has become, and I have to tell you truly, although I had high hopes that my analysis was correct, it has become extraordinary to witness how eagerly the international community has welcomed this new platform and how they almost flock into this dialogue now every year. And in addition, we have this year, and will continue in the coming years, organized so-called Arctic Circle forums in other countries, more specialized and smaller in scale. The first one will be in Alaska in August, on the 25th and the 26th of August this year, dedicated primarily to ports and sea routes, bringing together those who want to discuss extensively how and where we plan for those ports and key harbor hubs that will be necessary in the Arctic. And in November, about less than a month after the assembly in Iceland, we will have a similar forum in Singapore, co-hosted by the authorities and the government in Singapore, like the governor of Alaska co-host the uh, forum up in Alaska, looking especially at the role of the Asian countries with respect to the oceans, the sea route, uh, and other parts. And my good friend, the premier of Quebec, has invited us to look into the possibility of having a similar forum in Quebec uh, next year, especially looking at regional plans uh, in uh, the Arctic, based on the very interesting and uh, fascinating Plan of the North, which Quebec created a few years ago uh, in a process which involved all the stakeholders within uh, the province. And that is particularly significant because very few people have realized that if we look at Greenland as a kind of a federal part of the Kingdom of Denmark, which it is when you look at the uh, governmental structure, even if Denmark is not a federal state, and then you look at Alaska, Canada, and Russia, more than 90% of the land mass in the Arctic is under federal structure. And that is a part of the Arctic vision and the Arctic future that has not yet been incorporated uh, successfully into the overall vision because we are still so geared to the nation state leadership and the role of the capitals uh, in all of this. Taking it all together, looking at how the Arctic Council has evolved and the Canadian chairmanship in the last two years and the early weeks of the American presidency, uh, chairmanship, already demonstrates how effective a tool and interesting platform the Arctic Council has become. 
Looking at the involvement of the indigenous people and other non-governmental organizations uh, in, the, uh, in the procedures and the working of the Arctic Council, looking at how more than half of the G20 countries have now been invited and accepted and are already part, and looking at the success of the annual Arctic Circle assemblies, as well as a multitude of other Arctic gatherings <coughs> all over uh, the Arctic countries. It is absolutely clear to me that we already now have a fascinating new structure of Arctic cooperation, which is ready to receive any <coughs> participation from any institutions or any individual or any government or any leader of any kind with the ideas and the imagination and the innovation to bring something to the table. And what is at stake is of course enormous because as I said in the beginning, this is a big part of the planet. This is a sensitive part of the planet this is a resource-rich part of the planet. This is the communication hub if the ice continues to melt of the second half of the 21st century and the 22nd century for the global uh, economy. And for me, to be privileged to participate in all of this has not only been politically important and of significance for my country, but intellectually, a fascinating journey. And to be able to witness how the power of our innovation can see real results within a few months or a few years, and how we can, despite all the conflicts and the problems in the world and the, uh, the, the slow-moving structures we already have all over the world, we can indeed go forward and create new realities in a monumental way, in an extraordinarily short time, with almost a ridiculous small amount of people, <coughs> is to me fundamentally good news. So let me invite uh, your institute to participate in this process. Let me pay my respect to the role of Canada in all of this, which has been very strong, very important, hopefully will continue to be greatly significant. Because without a constructive <coughs> and strong Canadian involvement, it will be very difficult to make a success of the Arctic challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you for an excellent speech. You did not disappoint. I'm sure uh, that uh, there's some questions for you and I'd invite you to come up here and I'll, I'll help, uh, help filter them a little bit and, uh, but uh, I'd be really very grateful if people could uh, think of a few, a few matters that, uh, that are relevant and uh, invite your participation. There's a microphone here. You would like to the microphone. Um, my name is Paul Durham, the Member of Parliament for Ottawa Centre, so I was, I was struck by the fact that uh, you had been travelling, I'm sure, to Gimli, Manitoba and other ports of call but hadn't uh, been able to, to be here, so I'm so glad you are here and welcome to Ottawa. I'm also the Foreign Affairs Critic for the Official Opposition and Vice Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, there's, that was a superb speech. Uh, you covered uh, a vast, well, almost as vast as the terrain itself. Uh, and there, there was a couple of things that I was taken by, and uh, I've certainly understood the need to engage outside of the Arctic, and particularly uh, your comments on Asia are prescient. My, uh, my question, though, is uh, you, know, you referenced the Arctic for many as being this, this new place of discovery, um, and notwithstanding you mentioned the Inuit and having been there and uh, lived sustainably for so long. But I was taken by that because I also recall you know, history and thinking back to the scramble for Africa. Mm. And what was that about? And it was about, in the end, domain and colonization and resources. Uh, I've been to the Congo. Um, I know the, the scarred history there. And I know we have much more modern institutions. We have this 
great laboratory, as you put it, uh, and particularly with the Arctic Council. But I'm extremely concerned that as the Arctic becomes discovered, uh, the, the tension that we have, and you mentioned it in your speech so well, is on the one hand, climate change and the effects. On the other hand, resource extraction. My question is, within the Arctic Council itself, and I'm delighted to hear uh, the, the attention, particularly uh, around the climate change talks coming up in Paris, will be paid appropriately to the Arctic, as you mentioned. But how is the Arctic Council able to um, be resilient, I guess, to have that balance of protecting uh, the environment? As we, let's be honest, we see the scramble. Uh, the northern route, I think most Canadians don't appreciate the fact, we talk about the Northwest Passage, well, that's, <laughs> when you consider what's happened in the northern route, uh, it's extraordinary to see how fast that development has happened with the participation of the Chinese, of course, with the rail. So my question is, are you concerned about the Arctic Council being able to be resilient to, uh, at times, push back, frankly, from this scramble, and that we can actually have sustainable development? And is there a need for uh, additional institutional development within the Arctic Council? Thank you. Well, let me take that first, and then we go to the next question, if that's OK with you. I know when we launched the Arctic Circle uh, and were planning the first assembly in Iceland, uh, there it was a time when Can Canada was taking over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and there was some concern here in Canada that we were creating a competitive forum with the Arctic Council. Uh, which was definitely not the case. I mean, many of us who, if not all of us, who founded the Arctic uh, Circle Assembly uh, were great, not only great supporters, but great advocates of the Arctic Council. But like the World Economic Forum, to use another model, has been very helpful in the post-Cold War period, in the globalized economic uh, economy period, to bring together many different stakeholders for a dialogue and discussions and contacts and so on. The Arctic Council needed a broader playing field uh, where the pressures of formal diplomatic decision making were not on, especially with respect to the observer states. And I think, in fact, the Arctic Circle assemblies serve the Arctic Council very well because we made this innovation to invite countries to have what we call country session in the plenary assembly. And some of them have already done that, like the United Kingdom, like France, uh, like Korea, uh, and like, like Japan. And now China and Germany will do it in October, the two leading economies of Asia and Europe. And thereby, if to use a simple analogy, they left off steam. I mean, they are invited to come. They can present their case, their interest, their policies, and take questions. That's important. So when we did this for the first time, and I invited Singapore and Korea to come. To put it bluntly, I wanted to know what the hell are you up to? I mean, what's your agenda? Why are you there? Why, you, why do you want to be in our part of the world? So the Arctic Circle Assembly invites us to test them openly in a democratic forum. Their policies, their intentions, their contributions, their science, and so on, which you can't really do in the Arctic Council because you still have to work out what role will they have at the table, and that could be complicated. Because one of the reasons why the Arctic Council has been successful, in my opinion, is that it is small, it is limited in a clear way to the eight Arctic states, and geography defines its mandate. And different from Africa, uh, the Arctic already has defined state structures and it has the law of the sea, although the United States has not signed it, it's observing it for all practical purposes. So we already have the legislative framework, different from Africa, where the rules of the game are defined. On the one hand, from the point of view of the nation states, the eight Arctic states, and on the other, fr from the law of the sea. But it is an open ocean, and the international law is that container ships can move around our part of the world. 
there's also a big part of the Arctic Ocean beyond 200 miles, which is open to fishing, uh, international fishing. And so the international law allows any country from anywhere in the world to come into this territory. And then you have Greenland, big parts of Canada, big parts of Russia, where relatively poor, relatively undeveloped regions have inhabitants who are saying to themselves, why shouldn't we be able to have economic progress? Uh, why shouldn't Greenland be allowed uh, to prosper? Why should it have to depend on a subsidy from, the, from Copenhagen in order to exercise the democratic rights of, uh, of self-government? And let's admit it, let's admit it that the indigenous people, people living in Alaska, Canada, Russia, Greenland, they had been there for even thousands, hundreds of years long before the Republic of Iceland or the state of Canada or the Russian Federation or the United States uh, were created. We are imposing relatively new state structures on people who have been there for a long time. And one of the things I will not forget from this meeting up in Alaska, you very kindly said you would not forget my speech, but, <laughs> but one of the things I will not for ever forget was a speech made by Edward Itta. Edward Itta is an old whaling captain from a small town in Alaska, where English is not the, the language of the town. They have to learn English as their second language. And he made a moving speech at that Arctic Imperative Conference up in Alaska three years ago, where he said, all throughout my life, he is now in his 70s, I have been negotiating with the oil companies, I've been negotiating with the state of Alaska, I've been negotiating with Washington, and, uh, and I've been doing this throughout my life on behalf of my people. But increasingly, increasingly, I've come to wonder whether maybe Sitting Bull was right. Those of us who remember the Indian stories uh, from our youth know that Sitting Bull was the Indian chief who refused to make any agreement with the new arrivals. And it was an extraordinary evidence to hear three years ago at Wadita, after being perhaps the most engaged negotiator on part of the native Alaskans, with every governmental and business structure in Alaska for the last 40 years, saying in his older years, maybe Sitting Bull was right after all. So we have to be humble, those of us who come from the governmental structures or from the international community. And we have to be respectful. And that's why the people in Bangladesh and others, despite the drawbacks of the involvement of the indigenous leaders in the Arctic decision making. So to sum it all up, uh, I am much more optimistic that we, we can move this forward because different from Africa, we now have this open democratic platform where we can have these discussions and debates and we, we give everybody a hearing. And what I like about the Arctic Circle Assembly and what I think is perhaps its most important contribution, and I will say this very openly, is that the leading countries on Asia and Europe, the leading countries outside the Arctic, who want to be involved in the Arctic, in addition to the Arctic states, of course, have accepted this as an annual international gathering where they are willing to come and be examined and be questioned and be tested. And that's not given. And that's not given. That was not the case in Africa. There was no forum where you could test the British, the Germans, and the Dutch, and the other, or the French. But now we have it in, in the Arctic. And that is a very important democratic, uh, almost human rights component of how, how we move forward.
Yes, I'm Werner Vnent, the German ambassador to Canada. Uh, dear Mr. President, uh, thank you very much for these uh, most interesting remarks and uh, enlightenment. Well, uh, I can confirm that uh, in the two and a half, more than two and a half years I, I work now in uh, Ottawa, the Arctic has become more and more important, not only because of the chairmanship of uh, Canada and the Arctic Council in the recent two years, but uh, in, in general and in a real sense. Uh, however, I wonder if uh, what you said that uh, all the other conflicts in the world, particularly Ukraine and, and Russia, does not have any impact on the uh, Arctic cooperation, if that really can stand uh, for much longer. The G7 summit meeting just confirmed uh, the commitment, the determination of the, of the seven uh, countries uh, to not accept what uh, Russia and the President is doing. And has not uh, President Putin said that uh, Russia would defend its interest in the North also, if necessary, with military means? And is not the status of the European Union, uh, is it not uh, probably the question of the status, uh, the, the first proof that, uh, well, there are influences uh, from uh, outside the region that will determine also the cooperation uh, in the North? Thank you. So you mean the status of the European Union within the Arctic? Uh, yeah, it has a temporary yeah, yeah, uh, observer yeah, status, yeah, as yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, yeah. not yet any yeah. chance to get a permit. <clears throat> but thank you very much for this question, because I think it's very important to, to uh, discuss this uh, uh, very, uh, very openly. Uh, at the Arctic uh, Circle Assembly last year, last October, uh, Admiral Papp, representing Sec Secretary Kerry, and Arturo Siliganov, uh, special representative of President Putin uh, on the Arctic, uh, famous Russian discoverer in this field. They came together in an informal dialogue on the sidelines of, of the Arctic Circle Assembly, which is an additional advantage of the Arctic Circle Assembly to bring all these people together. And in that dialogue uh, constituted what has been the practice so far that both Russia and the United States will try to keep the Arctic cooperation, the Arctic dialogue, moving forward with as little disturbance uh, from conflicts and concerns and problems in other parts of the world. And everything I have seen from the new American chairmanship of the Arctic uh, Council uh, and how Russia is accepting the American leadership in the Arctic Council is a proof of that, uh, of that determination. Whether it will be successful or not will remains to be seen. Of course, it's possible that conflicts in other parts of the world will become so difficult, so overwhelming, uh, so fundamental to all the international community and that it will start having impact in other territories. But let's face it, whatever we do about the Arctic in Iceland, whatever the U.S. does about the Arctic, Without a successful Russian engagement in the Arctic, we will fail, whether we like it or not. I mean, they are the biggest Arctic player. Just look at the map on the, on the, on the table. Uh, simple geopolitics. And I have to tell you, it might not be popular to say it, given the present climate uh, with respect to uh, Putin and, uh, and Russia. So far, they have been pretty constructive in the Arctic. If you look at the track record of Russia in the last few years on the Arctic, they have resolved the long-standing dispute with Norway, which had been a difficulty for sort of for decades. Uh, they had the leading negotiator together with the U.S. on the search and rescue agreement, on the oil spills agreement. Uh, they invited American uh, oil companies and other companies into Russia to partner with them in the uh, utilization of the Arctic. Then the sanctions moved some of them out. So although they are now building up some of their presence, it's, it was kind of inevitable. And like somebody, I th think, I think it was Admiral Papp, in fact, who said a few weeks ago, that if you look at what the Russians are doing in terms of so-called military or hardware infrastructure in the Arctic, it's basically moving up to levels they, they were before, and which are normal levels to expect it. I, I have not seen anybody being able to put forward any evidence 
or what is a military aggression of Russia in the Arctic. If somebody has that evidence, I would like to see it. The fact of the matter is that uh, the longest list of unsolved disputes in the Arctic are between Canada and the United States. And if we solve the disputes between Canada and the United States, we would almost have a dispute-free boundary uh, in the Arctic. Russia is not a problem so far as solving boundary disputes uh, in, in the Arctic. And we have to be very careful not to take this alarmist rhetoric and in a kind of hurt instinct from the media 24-hour news cycle, uh, let it overtake everything uh, we are we are doing. I mean, I am often asked, uh, aren't you afraid of the Chinese and the Russians and so on? What is the country we are cooperating most extensively with in terms of, uh, of uh, investment and wanting to take economic advantage of Iceland within the Arctic? It's Germany. It's Germany. With the agreement on the, with, with Bremen on the new port, and of course we welcomed it. I worked on it myself, and it's great news, and very good for us to be able to say to these scaremongers who are talking about China and Russia and uh, Iceland should be afraid and we should not allow them and we should be very careful to point out, uh, look guys, I mean, the most extensive cooperation we have in economic infrastructure term is, is with Germany. With respect to the European Union, uh, again, I mean, I'm not a spokesman for Russia here today, although some of you might think so, but, <laughs> but kind of Putin has a point. I mean, how many seats do the European Union countries want at the Arctic table? Denmark has a seat for Denmark, it has a seat for Greenland, it has a seat for the Faroe Islands, and then now they want a seat for the European Union. You have Germany as an observer state, you have France as an observer state, you have uh, Britain as an observer state, you have Sweden as a full member, you have Finland as a full member. I mean, it's not easy to see why, why should the European Union, who's a group of these countries that are already inside, then also have a seat. Do you invite the Asian Development Bank as well? Do you invite the new Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank uh, as well? Or do you invite the Asian Associations uh, as well, since you have invited Singapore and Korea and China and Japan? It's complicated. It's complicated. Uh, so, when we start moving organizations of this kind that happen to be outside the Arctic and inside, like the European Union, we have to be clear what we say to other parts of the world uh, as well. And also, let me say this again, I think part of the success of the Arctic Council is that we have had these eight nation states there at the table. And they're very different, United States, Canada, Russia, and then the five Nordic countries. And part of the success is that we have been able to evolve these structures without the complications of other large international diplomatic sort of gatherings. So if the U European Union was invited to the table, we have to be very careful about what kind of role is the European Union then going to play. Uh, and I think we can now take a few years where we answer the question with respect to the observer states we have already accepted, which we have not yet answered. That's one of the tasks uh, ahead for us, to give concrete answers to my friend, Monsieur Rocard. When will France be allowed to speak <laughs> at, at, at the Arctic, Arctic table? <coughs> I know this is an analysis that some of my friends in the European Union <coughs> find very difficult in understanding because somehow the spirit of the European cooperation is that we should be everywhere. We, we should be everywhere. But uh, there are arguments that have been put forward that have uh, had an impact on the decision so far. And maybe Russia has a hidden agenda to be aggressive in the Arctic. But I think the decision by Washington so far has been to try to test Russia in a positive way with respect to Arctic engagement and help the U.S. chairmanship to reach success in its policy. Uh, 
And until we see something else, I think it is a wiser policy to move forward uh, on that basis. A few uh, very quick remarks. Uh, first of all, I have some thank yous to express. Uh, I'd like to thank once again the Embassy of Iceland in Canada and, and Ambassador uh, Sigurd Jonsson for being our co-host today. Um, and uh, secondly, I'd like to uh, also thank a few people behind the scenes who helped to make things happen, including uh, CG Distinguished Fellow John Higginbotham and Canada's Ambassador to Iceland, Stuart Wheeler, who's here today. Thank you. Uh, but mostly, I'd like to thank uh, President Grimson for his excellent remarks today, for your insights. Uh, you know, you spoke at the outset of your remarks about the Icelandic explorers who helped to open up the Arctic uh, to uh, the eyes of uh, European capitals and others. And I think today uh, Arctic exploration is still occurring, but not only of the vast territory that you've described and, and the wealth and the resources that are there and the opportunities, but also um, uh, exploration of new models of cooperation. You've described the openness of the, the Arctic Circle as a complement to the Arctic Council and the way that can be a testing ground for new ideas. You've spoken of, often of innovation in, in policy. Um, that is music to the ears of an organization like CG, which is all about uh, policy innovation. Um, after hearing your remarks today, I'm especially proud to notice that Iceland is actually a part of our, our corporate logo. You appear in our, our logo, and now I'm more proud of that than ever, having heard your, uh, your bold and frank remarks about the need for innovation in policy and how the Arctic can be a testing ground for that. Uh, so for all of your uh, generous uh, time with us today, for your, uh, your visit to Canada and for being with us and sharing your thoughts, we thank you once again. He also uh, is very conscious of uh, Iceland's own national interests in uh, taking full advantage of its uh, Arctic location and advantage. I think, for example, as somebody who has been looking particularly at Arctic marine issues, uh, the proposals going around for uh, creating a uh, Arctic marine hub port in Iceland as a way of taking advantage uh, of uh, increasing traffic through the northern sea route in Russia and other sea routes as they become opening. We're very lucky to have him with us today. He's been president of Iceland for nearly 20 years. His role is not merely symbolic. He was, uh, uh, he has, he's an elected president, which is uh, with important powers that he's exercised on occasion internally on critical national questions. To give you an idea of the prestige, his prestige and legitimacy in Iceland, he was elected by large majorities or acclamation for each of his terms. Uh, Mr. President, I'm sure I speak for all of us here in welcoming you to Ottawa, capital of a, an Arctic nation slight, <coughs> slightly larger than yours. Uh, but which, which we as a country face many unique issues and challenges in Arctic social and economic development. I believe we can learn much from Iceland's coherence, focus, and energy in pursuing its Arctic advantage. I hope you can speak frankly to us about the challenges we alone and together must uh, address in coming years. Your timing is coming, coming could not have been better. There's a growing awareness in Canada of new Arctic challenges, stimulated in part by our, uh, our recent successful chair of the Arctic Council. The quality of the audience that has come out to, to meet you and to listen to you this morning is a tribute to your remarkable experience and vision. We're delighted you're here, and I hope it's also a signal of Canada's awakening to the enormous forces of change uh, coming in the Arctic. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, Your Excellencies. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, <clears throat> kind introduction and uh, and for inviting me to uh, share with you here this morning my thoughts on the Arctic, especially 
as a territory of innovation in international, uh, international governance. I have uh, for a long time believed that uh, <clears throat> the Arctic is intellectually perhaps the most fascinating laboratory of governance innovation in the 21st century. I know it might sound as a startling comment to many who are interested in other international issues. But if you are ready, I'm prepared to argue that case for long hours uh, <laughs> in order to justify <clears throat> my conclusion. But let me also say I'm very pleased to be back in Ottawa. Uh, I came here first uh, in 1983 as a young parliamentarian, a member of an international parliamentary organization which was also trying to create uh, innovation in international governance for a meeting with, uh, with Pierre Trudeau. Uh, that was my first introduction to Canadian politics. Maybe I started at the uh, highest level, but it was uh, indeed a memorable encounter, especially for a young member of parliament from Iceland, to witness uh, the intellectual force of his argument. Uh, the change is going to bring to the Arctic, and particularly the uh, environmental, uh, Aboriginal issues, and also the paramount need for international cooperation among Arctic stakeholders. Uh, I have been working on the Arctic ever since. I've been uh, keeping myself out of trouble, organizing a number of private stakeholder meetings, largely Canadian, but with a heavy American presence on uh, Arctic marine issues, Arctic governance issues, uh, all, all different issues trying to nudge the uh, stakeholders to cooperate even more with each other within government, between government and industry, between nations and so forth. So very much along the, the themes that uh, the President's speech inspired me to do. Um, I might say that in this effort I've been received the strongest possible support from uh, CG, from Carleton and from uh, a number of government departments uh, that are interested in the Arctic. Uh, it will take us a while to really build up the enthusiasm and the energy in North America around these important changes in the Arctic. We have to, we're not really there yet in respect of our, our understanding of the urgency of anticipating and shaping Arctic development. Uh, President Grimson himself is personally uh, uh, contributing to this effort. For the last couple of years, he's hosted the highly successful Arctic Circle conferences held each fall in Reykjavik. Thousands now come every year for what is uh, the world's premier non-governmental meeting, I would say, of, uh, it's, it has become a remarkable marketplace of ideas and networks and personalities. And as a, as a good diplomat, uh, he, President Olafur Ragnar Grimson to, uh, to you all. I first encountered our guest uh, in Alaska about three years ago at a major international Arctic conference, the uh, Arctic Imperative Summit. That conference made a great difference to me uh, personally because I was at that time, uh, had just left government and I was looking for something that would keep me busy, keep me out of the bars and things uh, 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 after government. And I settled, though I'd had a long experience in foreign affairs and in transport, I'd mainly specialized in China, uh, policy planning, uh, uh, the United States, uh, transport and so forth. But I gradually came to realize, I think, the importance of looking at the Arctic as one of the key factors of change uh, facing Canada and uh, the Arctic nations and the world uh, in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, I uh, had heard that a head of state was uh, going to be onerous with his presence. And that's, where, of course, where I first uh, encountered uh, uh, President Grimson. I was very struck by the power of his ideas and uh, he gave at that time a very interesting speech uh, on the Arctic and on the need for cooperation in the Arctic. What impressed me most was his 
his long-term vision of the opportunities and challenges created by the rapid melting of the Arctic Ocean, climate change, and the huge range of uh, national and international policy issues that have to be faced by all of us in dealing with the Arctic. At the same time, his, uh, I found his basic optimism about an, an energy devoted to the Arctic uh, well balanced by concern about the challenges that uh, climate change Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, special breakfast event. Bienvenue, Madame et Monsieur. Um, we are especially uh, pleased and honored to uh, welcome the President of Iceland, Olafur Ragnar Grimson, to this event here at the Rideau Club, co-hosted by the Centre for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say, and the Embassy of Iceland, and I'd especially like to thank and welcome our co-host, uh, Sturla Sigur Jonsson, the Ambassador of Iceland to Canada. We have many esteemed guests here today. We have uh, members of parliament, we have ambassadors, we have senior government officials, uh, members of academia, non-governmental organizations, the private sector and media. Everyone here is a VIP, so I cannot introduce you all, uh, but I'd like to thank you all for coming. And uh, our event today is titled The Global Arctic, A New Model of Global Cooperation. And to more properly introduce our honored guest today, I would like to call on John Higginbotham. He is a senior fellow at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. He's also a distinguished fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation and leads CG's research work on Arctic governance and Arctic policy. So John, please come on up. Uh, thank you very much, Fred. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see such an impressive turnout of uh, Ottawa's uh, Arctic fraternity here. Uh, it's a great pleasure and uh, an honor for me to introduce uh, 